Welcome back to the Taoist Arts Organization International Podcast. This is our Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Ken Gullett. Ken is an internationally recognized martial artist, teacher, and author. He is the host of the very popular Internal Fighting Arts Podcast and runs an online learning platform at internalfightingarts.com. Ken is our first returning guest. His original Dowie interview is episode 007, and you can check that out to find out more about Ken's martial arts background. But today... We're going to talk about Ken's newest book, A Handful of Nothing, 88 Stories Pointing the Way. Uh, now, Ken, you've written a, a number of books. How many? Yeah, there we go. Very nice. That's okay. my author. Um, you've written several books. This is like what's your 10th or 11th book, something like that? Uh, something like that. Um, most are ebooks, and one is a paperback. And they're all basically Kung Fu instructional books, uh, most of them. And this is the first really philosophical book other than one called Signpost on a Martial Arts Journey. But yeah, this this is more based on Zen Buddhism and things I've also incorporated from philosophical Taoism. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll we'll definitely talk about the book here in just a second, but kind of just to to set up a little bit of the background. Um, you know, the last time we talked, you and I have a lot of things in common. And one of the things we have in common is we both grew up in an area of America that's commonly known as the Bible Belt. <laughs> and um we talked a little bit about some maybe not so fun experiences we had uh as youngsters um in a mm, how would you how would you describe your your uh the religious environment that you grew up in. Let's start off from there. Just very conservative uh, with the threat of eternal torture uh, in the background. And that's one of the things, I guess, that caused me to veer away. And also the day they told me that the Beatles were promoting Satan <laughs> with their lyrics. And I thought, why in the world do you have to lie to me about that? Yeah. And that started my questioning. Was that was that the moment that you that you realized that the maybe the the uh, environment that you grew up in wasn't wasn't for you that you had to find something different? That's the day I started questioning. But I think the Kung Fu TV show actually really started my journey away in a serious way because I'd never heard anything so peaceful and pleasant and something never heard anything that resonated with me like when the Taoist monks or Zen Shaolin monks they were probably Taoist and Zen Buddhist and the conversations they had with the young monk was just eye-opening to me yeah I felt the same way I grew up watching that show in, in syndication with my dad my dad was a big fan of the show and um to me, what appealed it appealed to me about it, aside from you know the martial arts, was the fact that the the religion, I guess, the way that I was looking at it from a child's perspective, you know, was were things that were like um, were very common sense. They were very plainly explained. There, there was nothing in it that you had to just take a leap of faith on. It was something where where an issue was explained in a way that you know it may have been poetic, but it made sense to me. One of the lines I remember was. The uh, the deer runs from the lion. It isn't cowardice. It's the love of life. Yeah. And I thought, that's a really, in the 1950s and 60s, that was a really different perspective than, you know, stand your ground and grab your gun. And, and right. <laughs> yeah, and that, unfortunately, that, that culture has gotten even worse. Yeah, it seems to have taken a turn that way here lately. Um, that, I guess, provided the initial spark. And did you seek out any writings on uh, Zen Buddhism or Taoism at that time? Do you remember what the first book that you read on those subjects? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, the first book I read is right behind me on this bookcase. It's the Tao Ji Kune Do. Oh, yeah. And Pretty early on in the book, there's a section on Zen. And uh, at that, when this book came out, the 
Kung Fu TV show was still on, I believe. I don't think it had been canceled quite yet. And uh, when I read that page, you know, things like the the softest thing cannot be snapped. And uh, I, it again resonated, not just from a martial arts perspective, but from a philosophical perspective. That's when I really started reading. And that would have been 74, 75 when that book came out. Did you have a, a favorite book about Taoism or, or Buddhism from that time period? My favorite book is uh, Zen Buddhism by Christmas Humphreys. Hmm. Uh, I bought it at a bookstore for $1.99 <laughs> and uh, was just fascinated by it. I, it was my companion and I, I've still got it over here too. It's all torn up and uh, got underlined red back when I underlined in red. But it, I started at that point really trying to focus and have moments of quiet. And uh, I remember the, uh, I went down to the ravine at Eastern Kentucky yeah. University and I sat there and trying to, what is enlightenment? What am I looking for here? Trying to, like in Qigong, you know, quote, in, kind of empty your mind, open up. And a little bird sat down, turned and stared me in the eye. And I had this little flash. We're connected. And everything is connected. And as soon as I thought, hey, I think I've got it slipped away. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the nature of those insights. You know, you shine a light on them and they're gone. Yeah. As soon as you realize, hey, I think I've got it. Nope. Nope. <laughs> there it goes. So in, in the book, um, you know, you have 88 short stories um and uh one of them is titled the pain of awakening mm. so when when you started to first have these insights was that um, was that a difficult from for you did, did it separate you from your family or your peers in any way back in the 1970s and maybe early 80s i really kept my mouth shut yeah well not completely my mother found out that I had separated from our faith, Christianity, which most Southerners belong to. And she told my sister, if anything happens to one of his children, he'll be back on his knees, which is a very strange thing for a mom to say, a yeah. grandmother of your kids. Right. And within two weeks, my daughter died. A uh, six-week-old daughter died of crib death. And that's when everything focused philosophically for me when we were in the funeral home. And I had them lift her out of the casket and I, I held her. Um, and in the back of my mind, I thought, okay, people are going to think you've gone crazy, but you haven't. You have to grieve. You can't fight this. And it was the, just the deepest hole I'd ever found myself in. And at the same time, this voice said, death is part of life. You can't appreciate the highs if you don't understand this is part of it. Yeah. And so that was the first time I really uh, decided this is something I can use to find my balance again. It took a while. I was walking wounded for a couple of years. I was in the lunchroom at work at, in a TV station, and TV people can be pretty uh, irreverent. I am too. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sitting there in, a, in the break room, and a photographer walks in, and he goes, hey, do you know the difference between a truckload of bowling balls and a truckload of dead babies you can't unload 
bowling balls with a pitchfork. And I had a flashback. Yeah. And I was back there discovering my daughter again. Yeah. So uh, that was a year and a half or so later. So you you walk wounded for a while, but it's not getting knocked down that's the problem. We all get knocked down. But can you rebalance? Can you find balance after that? And that is really what Taoism, philosophical Taoism and Buddhism, uh, Zen Buddhism did for me. Yeah. And, and that's a that's a recurring theme in your book is the the transformative power of suffering. You know, there's there's no avoiding yeah. suffering. None of us can avoid it. You know, it's guaranteed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, throughout the book, well, before we get into that, maybe you can explain a little bit about sort of like the, the premise for the book, like the, the master and, and the student. Can you <laughs> set the scene for us before we start diving into the actual book itself? Yeah, it's not a book that you read like a novel necessarily. Right. Um, if you just take one story a day, they're, they're short. They're, some are one page long, some are two pages. Uh, there are a few four page stories, but not very many and my idea was take one a day and just think about it that day think about how that works into your life the pain of awakening you mentioned um, how difficult it is for some people to awaken I mean the term woke right now is used as a weapon yeah if and the Buddha means one who has awakened. Right. Because you become aware and awake to people who are having, who are suffering and want to help. Um, but I'm getting off the, off the subject. But each, <laughs> each story is like that one. You know, one is the pain of awakening. One is, are we in a cult? Yes. And that's a short one. Yeah. And the young monk asks his old master about these issues. There's one on immigration. There's one on women's rights. And, uh, how do we approach these topics through the lens of Zen? How do we maintain our integrity as far as our beliefs go? Um, and that's the purpose of the book. Yeah, I think it's important, like, um, that it, the book consistently emphasizes, you know, I think there's one story where they're looking at a tree that's been struck by lightning and has all yeah. the damage and stuff to it. But like the the abbot or the older monk is explaining to the novice monk, you know, these are things that happen to us in our life. They're not personal. They're, they're things that, you know, that transform us as, as we go through life. And it's, it's not necessarily a negative to suffer. Oh, right. And that uh, that is a direct result of my experience with not just my daughter, but I mean, I'm, we all go through things. We lose jobs. We lose marriages. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things happen. I grew up with a mom who could fly into rage like that, and violent rage. And my dad apparently didn't pay his bills very well. And so every few months we moved to a new house, a new school system. Um, to me, that was normal. So I, I kind of developed the ability to roll with the punches um, but but all of the philosophies, philosophical Taoism and Zen, really is all about that. It's about finding your balance and transcending what's happening and accepting change because what we expect to happen isn't necessarily what's going to happen. So you have to expect the unexpected and deal with it. Right. The only constant is change. Yeah. 
So that's one of the things that martial arts is really great for. You know, it, it teaches you that whether you want to learn it or not. If you're trying to learn martial arts, you, you learn that, you know, you might have this great technique that, you know, you think is going to work every time and it doesn't. Uh, you, <laughs> you know, you get you constantly are getting humbled by yourself and, and by others. And uh, it's sort of like a microcosm of life that way. It's a good training ground. I remember I used to keep track of of the uh, score when I sparred in a tournament. And I, if I won my first match and I had the red sash on my back to differentiate me from the other guy, then I wanted every match, I wanted that red sash. And if I didn't have it, you know, the superstition thing, yeah. athletics, athletes have that all the time. Right. Um, but one day I realized for one thing, I, I'm not going to keep score because I'm just going to focus on what's happening. And for another thing, I'm not going to give that power to a red sash. Right. Uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, sparring is good because, what is it Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until he's punched in the mouth. Right. So, <laughs> so true. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Tyson's a philosopher, too, I think. <laughs> awesome. Were any of your martial arts teachers um, sort of uh, religious or philosophical? Did, did any of your major teachers ever talk about these sorts of things with you? The and only one, yeah, the only one who really made it part of the art was uh, Philip Starr in Omaha. He teaches a system called Yi Li Chuan, and it meant one principle boxing and uh, he taught about connecting he would tell us in class when we were doing one steps or different things with our partner you could hear him go connect and we practiced that we tried to become our partner our opponent uh, really uh, philosophically he gave me a push in this direction to really incorporate the concepts of centering and connection in my daily life. Now that's when I really started doing Qigong and I would practice every day at lunch, I'd practice the microcosmic orbit or uh, just sitting meditation, uh, Qigong. And I, uh, really enjoyed it. It was kind of a turning point in some ways. I don't know if I told this story on the last podcast, but one day a, a funnel, a wall cloud was passing the station ready to drop a tornado. And people were panicking. They were running cameras outside. I heard somebody say, Dr. Chill. And I looked <laughs> over and the sports guy was laughing. And I said, what? And he said, everyone's going crazy. You're just sitting there getting the job done. And that's when I realized I was remaining centered. And I was using the principles of Qigong to calm myself in the middle of the storm. And that is a really good benefit of that. Yeah. Qigong has been massively beneficial for me because it's only just recently that I've been able to do sitting meditation just because I'm the type of person that needs to be moving all the time. I don't like sitting still. I never have. But in Qigong, even though you're not moving much, you're moving some. You know, it's almost a way to distract yourself while you're getting that internal work done. Um, and it's helped me a lot. And I've had similar experiences to the experience that you just talked about where people, you know, almost upset that you're not upset because something's going on. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? You know, you're, you're just sitting there, you know, so calm. But yeah, it's it's definitely beneficial. But that and it takes work too. Oh yeah, you know, I don't know. Sometimes we get the impression, or some people do that. Well, what do you mean you're working at it? It's, it should be easy, shouldn't it? No skill is easy. Right. And you know, I, I I noticed that you're you look like you're looking at me. Mm -hmm. And my camera's up here, so I look like I'm looking down when I'm looking at you. <laughs> I've got to get a good camera for right in the center of the screen. No, you're fine. <laughs> a 
Well, that, the Qigong thing actually kind of leads nicely into like one one of the stories in the book. And this is something that, you know, at the beginning of your podcast, the Internal Fighting Arts podcast, you know, you have your uh, like sort of opening trailer. And one of the things that it says is never check your mind at the door of a martial arts studio. And in the book, <clears throat> there's a story called Are We in a Cult? Where the um, disciple goes to the master because of a person in the town said to him, he called him a crazy cult member or something like that. And then he yeah. goes to the, the master and says, are, are we in a cult? And then the master asks him some questions. Could you maybe talk about just that one story a little bit? Because I thought that was a good sort of a um, checklist that people can use for themselves to see if what their religious beliefs are, are philosophical beliefs, or maybe they might might be in a cult. And that, that. that actually story that came up uh, because I saw someone talking about martial artists and these different schools are just, they create cults. And I thought, well, that's interesting. What is a cult? And what a, what a cult actually is, is are you, they isolate you. Yeah. And um, there is, there are consequences if you don't isolate and don't follow them and believe everything they believe. You, and you can't question. Um, I look at, for example, I don't want to, I'm not going to criticize anyone, but occasionally people have knocked on my door with thin black ties and white shirts and they're, they have the Bible in their hand and they want to invite me to their church or preach the gospel to me and a lot of times they're young men and I say oh what college do you go to <laughs> yeah they discourage education yeah they don't want their people to be educated and I've noticed that in a lot of fundamentalist religions if you are discouraged from associating with people outside of your group or afraid of education because it might make you see a bigger picture. You know, those are signs of cult. Yeah. And yeah so I mean, that's what the master tells the young monk. Yeah. That uh, you're free to do really anything you want. Yeah. Uh, and he, he, like, one of the things he tells the monk is, like, you, you can leave here you know, and not be a monk anymore and come back and visit us and we'll we'll welcome you back and be glad to see you. You're not going to yeah. be shamed or we're not going to pretend that you don't exist. And, and those types of cult type, uh, that mentality or that cult controlling behavior, you know, doesn't just exist in religious institutions. It can exist in martial arts schools or any, really any type of group. Yeah, there, there are. I went to a tournament once and there were these young guys there and one of my students asked if they were going to spar and they said no we can't because the first technique we learn will cause all of your internal organs to explode yeah so we knew immediately that this was something a bit different and you know you do see it and and but i carry that it's not cultish necessarily but for example feng shui i'm not a fan if you believe as some do for example in one of the books i had it said do not put a broom in the same room as a sick person a broom will sweep away life and i thought no why give the, a broom the power to do that i that, that's where I would break with between philosophy. Okay, there's philosophy and then there's something else. Yeah, it's a particular problem, I think, too, in the sort of the little microcosm or subculture that we inhabit with martial arts and, and things like that is that um, a lot of this information, not a lot, all of this information comes to us from another culture. It comes to us through another language. Um, and people sometimes forget that uh, all of these, all cultures around the world have different uh, strata of beliefs within a belief system. For instance, you can have a person who believes in Taoism strictly as a philosophy, 
or you can have a person who believes in Taoism or religion, but you can also have a person who believes in Taoism who believes a lot of things that are not really a part of Taoism. They're sort of folk superstitions. And, and, yeah. and some of that stuff can bleed in there. Um, and then also when these things come from another culture to the West, you have people that want to throw their own two cents in there and, and say, yeah, this is a part of feng shui that if you put a, a broom in a room that, you know, it's going to sweep somebody's life away if they're ill. Whereas the original, I think, intent of feng shui was just to sort of like uh, arrange things in the most harmoniously flowing uh, a nature or most aesthetically pleasing nature or, you know, things yeah. like that. So people tend to forget that stuff sometimes that there's a lot of, there's always human opinion and human preference that are in Japan. <laughs> People in quite a bit, you know, I studied acupuncture for a couple of years and really gave a lot of that a good faith effort to, to do. And then I got to the point where I thought, okay, I, I'm not sure it works quite like they say it does. And so it's not for me, but if you're an acupuncturist, hey, I'm, I can be your friend. Sure, yeah. But yeah, it, it tends to upset people though, if they find out, uh, if a Christian finds out you're not a Christian, that upsets them. Yeah. And if someone who's really heavy into Taoist arts and Qi, they find out, you're a little more uh, maybe non-believing on that. Um, they can get upset too. So, uh, yeah, you just have to. You don't have to agree with everybody to be their friend or their teacher. Right. Even some of my teachers didn't agree with me on. <laughs> on yeah. <G. laughs> yeah, it's it's funny to me. It's one of the weirdest things about being a human being is that you can be good friends with somebody and really hit it off and you're getting along just fine. And then all of a sudden they find out that you belong to a different political party or a different religion or something else. And all of a sudden it's just, they're, you know, they don't want to talk to you anymore. It's like, what happened? You know, five minutes ago we were laughing and having a good time. And now because of this one thing, I'm all of a sudden, you know, and it's human nature, you know, uh, I, it's, it's a shame, but it's you common. Know, I'm, uh, believe it or not, I'm keeping this book on Zen Buddhism uh, kind of on the down low from some of my more yeah. fundamentalist relatives. Yeah. I'm not, I, I sometimes have to restrict them from a Facebook post about it. And yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, they, I accept them, but if they read this, they would literally think I was going to be tortured for eternity and yeah. was uh, influenced by Satan. <laughs> right. Yeah, but that's, that's one of the things this book is one of the reasons I wrote it to understand this is compassionate. Yeah, I mean, the some what you do when you are into philosophical Taoism and Buddhism, you are connected with everyone, and that means you see someone on the street poor, you hurt for them, you want to help. Um, and it's a very good way to live, in my opinion. I agree. And, you know, we, we need a lot more of that right now in the society, for sure. Is, especially is, this year. Yeah, especially this year. That's right. Was that it? Was that the impetus for the writing of the book? Did you just feel like it was time for something like that? Um, no. Um, I, this has been bubbling for many years. But I wrote one of the little stories, I put it on my blog and it was so popular that I thought there's a hunger. Yeah. And I've written about philosophy on my blog for a long time. I've been doing it for 18 years. And I, I always have gotten good feedback. And, you know, I've talked about what I've been through with my health. And um, sorry about that. You're fine. And about how I've used the philosophies and my health issues and just trying to stay alive and in the hospital. And I get emails from one, one guy said, I was in the hospital and might not have made it, 
but I remembered your story and thought, if you can do it, I can give it a shot. And I felt there is a hunger for a positive message on how do we look at life as it is with compassion and kindness and, and not uh, seeing the threats of eternal punishment, that sort of thing. And just accepting people and accepting what happens. All right, I, I went in for a one hour procedure. They walked out and told my wife, there's nothing more we can do for your husband. Yeah. And she was sitting there thinking, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah. Uh, but it, it did. And we just, I didn't worry about it. I just sat there and thought about that tournament coming up in six months. Yeah. Which you made it to, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. And that, that, that's a funny thing, too. You know, again, like, again, we talked earlier about how the, you know, the theme of suffering, you know, is in the book a lot. And I had a similar experience to that. Um, I had a life threatening uh, condition and uh, I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. I had to have several surgeries to, to repair it. Mm. Uh, you know, I still had this clinging thing from my childhood about, you know, you're going to die and go to hell if you don't believe this that and the other and that was a real turning point for me because i had to figure out whether i was just going to fall back onto a crutch or stand my ground and take what life was giving me and uh it made me a lot happier person it's the best thing that ever happened to me because it it, it made me face this choice that i had to make and uh you know i just i wanted to choose a a reality that that uh you know, I wanted to take what life was giving me and deal with reality on its own terms, I guess, instead of trying to like make it what I wanted it to be, which it wasn't. Great. And that happened to me when my daughter died, you know, instead of going back on my knees, yeah. begging forgiveness to a higher invisible being, I decided I'm quite comfortable with my beliefs, even in the midst of the worst tragedy. Yeah. And so you you find strength from that. And there's a story that's told about people like you and I <laughs> that in, in the more fundamentalist uh, or evangelical uh, groups, they, they believe that on our deathbeds, we will uh, refute everything we say we believe in and go back. But that once you leave, it's really difficult to accept it again. Yeah. And I don't think they understand just how comforting it is to think I was not here for an eternity and I had no complaints at all. I was in perfect peace and I will return to that someday. Yeah. And even for me, it's a bit freaky thinking I'm not going to remember my wife. I'm not going to remember uh, Lao Zhe Yilu or the five fist postures or yeah. all the fun I've had, but it's perfect peace. How do you, how does that not give you some comfort? Yeah. And the flip side of that too, I think is that when you believe that way, it makes everything that you experience and enjoy in this life that much more precious because, yeah, you know, I think so this too. is your go around. You know, this is your shot. That's right. And, and it makes you wonder. I'm, I, there was a time in my life I thought about afterwards, heaven or the life after, but that pulls you out of the mindfulness you need to really enjoy now. Yeah. And that's one of the messages, again, in these stories. But it's part of philosophical Taoism. Yeah. Be completely in the present. Yep. You know, it's happened a lot of times changing jobs. I, you, I, I walked in, I, I had a six figure job in Tampa yeah. at the University of South Florida. They came in and fired me. It was very political, and I had no idea when I took the job. But, uh, I went home and thought, what next? And within three days, I started the online website, the school, and 
just went from there. And it's part of the idea of you're like in Tai Chi, push hands. All right, I didn't expect this kind of force. How do I neutralize that and regain my center? How do I hide my center from my partner? And uh, it's, that's what this philosophy is. You maintain your center. If you lose it, all right, there, find it again. Right. Yeah, it's a new center you know, moves you into a new place. Yeah. Um, one of the things I thought about when I was reading the book, it was your writing process because I thought, well, you know, the, all of the stories involve this master and the student. And I was like, Ken is writing this and he's writing the part of the master and he's writing the part of the student, you know, and we, we we've all, you know, we are going to be in those roles, both of those roles at various points in our lives, you know, where we're teaching or being taught. Um, what did you teach yourself while you were writing this book? Was there anything that you wrote down that surprised you as you were writing? Or was everything something that you'd sort of already thought out in your mind before you put it down to paper? You know, a lot of it had crossed my mind at times, but a lot of these questions are things that I think about in daily life. And so I spent some time, I had my phone and I would think of, just being out or watching the news or reading, I would think, well, what about this? And I'd write that down. And so I started with the question, what, what should I think about trans people? Mm -hmm. um, and so there are corresponding answers to that. Well, just because you don't understand someone doesn't mean they're lost. Right. That's an old Zen saying. And so I thought, how would a young monk wonder about this? And how would he approach the master? What would the master say? So I, I worked, uh, my goal was to do three stories a day. And it took several hours, but... Uh, I was really inspired once I started doing it. Yeah. And I, at first I wanted to do a hundred stories and I thought, well, 88 is kind of a lucky number in Chinese. So, <laughs> so let's stop it at 88. Yeah, Maybe I'll do another uh, book. Yeah, for sure. The, another handful or <laughs> another handful of nothing. Yeah. A boatload of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> now my wife laughed when I, Older the title, a handful of nothing. That's a great title. I thought that was insulting. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great title. It sounded to me like sort of a, a Zen version of a spaghetti western, handful of nothing. Like, <laughs> That's you know, right. A fistful of nothing. Fistful uh, of nothing. Yeah, that can be the sequel. Fistful of nothing. The revenge. And that comes from the story of like trying to stop time. It's like trying to stop this river. Yeah. You know, you scoop the river up. What do you have in your hand? It's yeah. a handful of nothing. That's, yeah. It, it's a great book. And, uh, you know, it's um like you said, it's 88 stories that are not really connected except for the setting. So it's not something that you necessarily have to pick up and read from beginning to end. You can pick it up and, you know, read any story from it at any place in time. And uh, I can already tell by the way the book is written. I think it's going to be one of those books where you could pick it up and read a story and then go back and read that story a year later and it probably have a different meaning for you at that point in your life just because the way things have changed around us so um well, thank you i hadn't thought of that but that's that's very nice no it's a great book might be right oh, i appreciate you bringing it up uh, it's quite a coincidence that we're doing this the week it came out yeah <laughs> yeah also the week of Chinese New Year. Yeah, Chinese New Year. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. And I know you don't believe in auspicious omens, Ken, but <laughs> <laughs> looks like it might be one. Yeah. Well, I, I just turned 71. So uh, I'm going to call it the year of the dragging. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. The year of the dragon. <laughs> so, so what's going on in your life? Oh, um, just doing this, uh, doing the podcast, doing the whole um, Dallas Darts Organization International thing. And I'm I'm teaching, still teaching Shingy and, you know, more of the same, much more of the same. So always burning the candle at both ends. 
Yeah, I'm curious about the Taoist organization and and what to, what you do with that. Yeah, it's coming along quite nicely. We're just, you know, making a lot of connections and let people come on here and, you know, um, tell us about their schools and tell us about their arts and things like that. And just kind of trying to build bridges is what we're trying to do. You know, there's there's so much of the opposite of that that goes on in the martial arts community sometimes. And, you know, we're, it seems like we're always getting in each other's way when we should be helping each other out. We have much more in common than we don't have in common. Yeah, uh, we get into little camps, don't we? Yeah, we do. Uh, just Again. like human nature yeah uh i should have you on my podcast actually to talk about all the stuff and the, oh, i'd love to come on and talk to you it'd be an honor i love your podcast um you know i expect i haven't been to china and one of the things i've kind of braced myself with this book is is someone reading something in it and then saying, oh, well, that wouldn't happen in a Chinese village or that. And hopefully uh, people will see it's the message that's important here. Yeah. More so than, than I don't consider myself a scholar and I don't consider myself a, an expert in Taoism or Zen Buddhism. But it's something that I love and have really tried to work Um uh, into my life for decades. And I think one of the main things is messages about it all is persistence. Um, no matter what you do, it works in martial arts, it works in life. Yeah. Just be persistent and you will develop skill. Yeah. Or if some, the yin yang, it's the positive and negative. When I got Divorced the second time. I mean, I was desperately in love with a very selfish person. Mm -hmm. So the divorce happened and it was a dark period, but I persisted. And within a year and a half, I met Nancy, which I can't imagine a better supporter and wife. And so when it gets d darkest, stay with it. Keep hopeful. Keep your eyes on the just one step ahead of the other because it almost always turns back to light in the end. Absolutely. And and that's that's the English translation of the phrase gung fu. You know, it's hard work, hard work over a long period of time. Yeah. And then when, it, everything. when good things go your way, <laughs> just expect the unexpected because it will turn back a little bit. Yeah. at some point yeah. yeah there's a there's always a balance things always seek a balance yeah one of the things i've heard that uh, i think is a really interesting part of these philosophies is uh, a student asked uh, his master i feel so discouraged what should i do the master said encourage others and I, that's the kind of thing in these philosophies that is so wonderful. Yeah. What do I do? Encourage others. Be kind. And then you'll find your own spirits lifting. Absolutely. Do, do good, be kind, share it on. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good message. And it's a great book. Um, Thank you. Full of nothing, 88 stories pointing the way. It's on sale now. So I encourage everybody to get a copy and check it out. Uh, Ken, it's been great talking to you.